So in Mark 10, 46, it starts. And they came to Jericho, and as he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great number of people, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And many charged him that he should hold his peace, but he cried the more a great deal. Thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Be of good comfort, rise, he calleth thee. And he, casting away his garment, rose and came to Jesus. And Jesus answered and said to him, What wilt thou that I sh should do unto thee? What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said unto him, Lord, that I might receive my sight. Verse 52, And Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. This is the way for the Mandalorian fans out there. This is the way, right? Okay. Well, hey, um, you all remember that game when you're kids, you put your hands into the fingers of your opponent and you play this game where you reel up the other person's hands until they squeal for mercy. Key word there. Thank you. That's kind of what's going on here. This beggar is not crying for grace, which wouldn't be bad, but he's crying out for mercy. Have, Lord, have mercy on me. He said, Lord, ease my burden a little bit here. Ease up on me. I want you to have that picture of the game mercy in your mind. When you think of this guy, the beggar, the blind beggar, he's asking for mercy. In the context of the situation, we, we have them going to Jericho. If you remember in the Old Testament, Jericho was the first town that the Israelites came into that God told them to go into and utterly destroy. Of course, they saved a few that were followers of Israelites, the uh, prostitute Rahab, right? And anybody that was with her that uh, helped the spies. Remember the spies, Caleb going in and spying out the land? So the ones that helped them, they preserved them, but everybody else they utterly destroyed. And Jericho's walls came falling down, but not until after they did this weird thing about walking around the town seven times and blowing the trumpets. They didn't tear down the walls. It was God's miraculous provision that caused those walls to fall down. So here we are at the very same place, but in New Testament times, so maybe a thousand or more years later, and Jesus is walking in those very same places. It's interesting to me that Jesus, having all knowledge, right, being God in the flesh, walking in this very place where some of his people walked in faith years before, not knowing how God was going to come through. And I'm thinking, this blind man is in a very similar situation. He's got walls up somehow over his vision. He doesn't know how God's going to come through. But he's calling upon the right person, the person of Jesus. This city of Jericho was known geographically. If you know anything about the geography of Israel, it's a very thin strip of land. It's smaller than Kansas, smaller than Missouri. It might be only two or three counties long. If you could imagine three counties, Wyandotte County, Johnson County, and I don't know what's south of Johnson County, but three counties tall might be approximately the size of Israel. It wasn't very big. So you have the Sea of Galilee, and you have a little river going south of Galilee, the River Jordan, right? River Jordan goes south into the Dead Sea. And it was that river that separated Israel from Israel. The outside, I can't remember what's over there, Moab or look in your maps, right? Okay. But that was the dividing line from outside and going in. So they were just inside the Israelites', Israelites border. And historically, this is where the Israelites would go when they're trying to go around Samaria. They would go outside the Jordan, down and around to get to Jerusalem. They wouldn't go through Samaria because they had problems with those people. They had serious religious and historical differences, and they ostracized those people. So Jesus was taking the normal route that an Israelite would take, even though Jesus, on numerous occasions, went through straight through Samaria. 
Jericho was known as an agricultural place where there was a lot of uh, productivity in palm plants and perfume plants. So oftentimes they would think, when they think of Jericho, you think of a sweet, uh, flowery perfume, okay? Because this is what was being produced in the Jericho area. And I think Jericho might even mean perfumed, if I'm not mistaken. You might have to look that up on me. But uh, anyway, so there's a little bit of geographical context for where in the world we're at. 2,000 years ago, Jesus is walking through this perfumed town that has a historical significance in the kingdom of God. And we have a blind beggar asking him for mercy. If you remember last week, we talked about James and John, one of the inner three, right? They went with their mother, who was probably cousin to Mary, Jesus' mother. And so these were relatives. They asked Jesus to give them a seat at the table in his kingdom, a seat to the right and the left, right? They wanted that privileged seat when he gets to his kingdom, which was common for people back then. If you're going to be in political power, you might as well put your buddies there with you, right? But they didn't come with Jesus' mindset. And they got a learned lesson on humility, right? In contrast, today we see a blind man asking to receive his sight. And he didn't ask the same way. Remember that James and John, they asked, Hey, Lord, will you give us whatever we ask for? They didn't even tell him what they were going to ask until he would say yes or no. Like, sounds like my kids, right? Hey, Dad, would would you give me whatever I asked for? Asher would definitely ask me that. (laughs) Try to con me into something. But anyway, this blind man, directly in contrast to the passages prior, is asking Jesus for something also. And Jesus says, tell me what you want. What, the, the KJV language is, what wilt thou that I should do unto thee? What do you want that I should do for you? Okay, that's, that's what he means. Well, I want you to think about this today. Why is this message important today? There's people that have needs that may not be the same as this guy, but there are people that have grudges against God, against Christians, for one reason or another. Maybe they got hurt, and they blame something associated with God for their division from the church, from godliness, from God himself. There might even be people within these walls who have mistakenly said things that have been hurtful, right? We're not perfect, so we we could have done that. I could have done that, okay? There are people today who might be angry, or maybe they really are feeling God's wrath. Maybe God's wrath really is, because the Bible does say God's wrath resides on the proud, right? He resists the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. So maybe God's wrath really is abiding on somebody that's having a frustrating situation, but we unknowingly walk by and whisper to them, like the crowd here in the situation, hey, be quiet. Hey, you shouldn't talk like that in church. Hey, you need to, you know, cool it. You can't talk to God like that. Or hey, you can't pray like that. I wonder if we might inadvertently, maybe not that outright, but subtly say things like that if we're not careful. I think even in my own attitude, I I question my, you know, do I have the right attitude before God? But you know what? God can handle my worst attitude on my worst day. He can And he can handle other people's worst attitude on their worst day, too. Believe it or not. (laughs) He can. Not to say that we shouldn't be careful how we talk to God, but we should be careful not to say things like, well, maybe they deserve what they're getting. Maybe they deserve. Maybe they sinned against God and deserve what they're getting. I mean, thoughts like that creep in if we're not careful, right? Why, Why are they suffering so much? Is God judging them? turns into, well, they're just under God's wrath if we're not careful, right? We can say things that are theologically not true. God's wrath, we have no idea where it's directed, honestly. We can try to judge from the fruit, from the outside. All we can see is the outside. We cannot see what's going on in the heart between them and God. We cannot see it. So to make a judgment like that is wrong. We can't. Now, if they open up to you, we can make suggestions. We can, we can expose them to God's Word and what it says. And certainly, 
if they're acting in a way that is opposing to God, we need to show them and help, help them to see, hey, that's opposing what God says here or whatever. We need to be helpful in those situations rather than hurtful. Those people that need God's help. Because we too are in need like that beggar. We all need to cry out because we all are undeserving of God's grace. We all need to be crying out, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. You all may not be suffering in the same way. My hope for you today is that you'll remember all the good that God is pouring out on you, that He has poured out on you, and you may not even realize it, but He may pour out some good on you in the future. Maybe, maybe not. I hope so. But none of that is deserved. You didn't earn it. You don't deserve it. And I think today our culture is so in that mindset of, we deserve it. We have rights. <laughs> not, you know, not talking about the Constitution, but there's this self-centeredness in the respect that we think we deserve a certain level of goodness from God because we believed He ought to give us fill in the blank. But God has poured out His goodness on you. Every breath that you have is another gift. Every day that you have is not earned. You didn't deserve what you have. And I'm not trying to just say that you didn't work hard for that because a lot of you probably did work hard for what you have. But what God has poured out on you is no reflection of your goodness. It, if anything, it's a reflection on His goodness and His character and His mercy and His love for us. Someone once said that we are merely hungry beggars showing other hungry beggars where there is food. And that's why we need to be sharing the gospel because there are other people that are hungry. They need the gospel. They don't know about Jesus. I have encountered people in this very neighborhood, in this very city, who have never heard about Jesus. If you look, you will find they are there. So there's two main points in this, you know, if we want to talk about two different things. The first, I want to talk about the blind man, and then I want to talk about the uh, all-powerful Savior God. The blind man. I think it's interesting that he called out in the way that he did. Do you see how he called out? He referred to Jesus as the son of David. It's interesting because, yes, Jesus was the son of David. And that refers to his kingship. Not just his lordship, not just his all-knowing, not just, I mean, there's a lot of attributes that you could attribute to Jesus, but this specifically refers to his messiahship, his kingship over Israel. He is the true king. But he was not reigning as king. King Herod was king, and, and how many other kings were there, you know? But this was the son of David, the prophesied Messiah. He's referring to it in that language. But not only that, his authority and his authority, he heard about the healings, he heard about the miracles. In fact, did you know in Mark, this is the very last healing before Jesus goes to the cross? This is it. There's not much else that happens in the book of Mark. After this, we have a few miracles, but no healings. This is it. And he asks, if you knew that Jesus only had one last healing <laughs> before he went to the cross, you'd probably be crying out too, right? I mean, he didn't know that, but that's what we read in Mark anyway. The guy was told to be quiet. Calm yourself, man. Don't be out of order. <laughs> They might have thought he was a loud mouth. They might have thought, well, that's what you got. In, it, it, that's how you got in the situation, probably. Anyway, they told him to be quiet. But he yelled all the louder. And I wonder for us, if when somebody tells you to be quiet or, or you're doing something wrong or, or um, maybe you get a little speed bump in your spiritual walk, do you, do you just quit? Or do you cry all the louder? Because we really need to press into God. We need to keep going. We don't need to back out when things get hard. You need to press into it. And, and 
This, this gets me in trouble sometimes. With God, that's what we need to do. Sometimes with people, we need to back off and give them a little bit of space. So with my wife, I'm the type to, I want to solve a problem. I'm not happy until we address the issue, and I don't like it if somebody just tells me, it's going to be okay. It'll all work out. No, I, I need to know how it's going to work out. I need to know a plan, make me a list. How, how's the order of events? What's the date this is going to start and end on? That's just my personality. It's just my personality. It's a tendency I have to work with. And so when we have a disagreement, pressing into that is not always a good thing. It causes her to withdraw. So when she withdraws, I just want to press in more. Doesn't work very good, right? But with God, you don't have to worry about that. The Bible says, you draw near to me, and I'm going to draw near to you. So you don't have to worry about those human kind of tendencies with God. He's always there. He's always present. He's always ready. So we don't have to worry about God withdrawing. He will withdraw if you're holding on to sin. He'll withdraw if you're walking away from Him. But He won't withdraw if you're intentionally drawing closer to Him. This blind beggar cried, Have mercy on me! What does mercy mean? I mean yeah, we got that game when we were kids we played, you know, mercy! But mercy really means to, uh, to let up on the suffering. Go easy on me. In Habakkuk 3.2, the prophet asks the Lord in, to, in wrath, which means godly anger, in wrath, remember mercy. So the prophet of God is asking God to be merciful in his anger. God gets angry sometimes, right? I know he gets angry about sin, right? He gets angry when people aren't listening. But despite God's judgment, this prophet asks for God to relent and to not pour out the full wrath they might have deserved. In Psalm 51, King David asked for mercy. In Psalm 51, he confesses his sin. He says, have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my sin and cleanse me from my sin. You know, David had a few sins. He looked at Bathsheba with lust. He ended up having her husband killed. He ended up marrying her, which he should have had nothing to do with, right? He did a number of other things. I mean, that wasn't the only thing. Stealing somebody else's wife is pretty grievous, if you ask me. But despite his many failures, David asked God to relent and not bring upon him the full consequences of his sin. You know, God is gracious, He's merciful, and when you, when you have sin, we all have sinned in the past. You shouldn't be continuing to sin, but you have sinned in the past. Time does not forgive sin. You might forget over time, but just because there's a great amount of time between now and when you sin doesn't mean it's forgiven until you dealt with it with God. You might have sinned 20 years ago, but if you haven't brought it before God and ultimately just poured out everything to God, then it might still be there. If you're still holding on to something just because time doesn't mean it's forgiven. Uh, I want to bring up another kind of caveat between grace and mercy. Grace and mercy are two churchy words that we use a lot. I want to make a differentiation because mercy and grace are not the same, but they're close. They're oftentimes used in the same passages even. Mercy is like that, hey, hold up on me. Hey, give, give me a break. Don't give me what I deserve. And then grace goes a step farther. He gives you what you don't deserve. He gives you something good, right? Grace is God extending favor toward us that we don't deserve. We didn't earn it. It, it doesn't belong to us. It is something that He willingly gives us by His own will. Both Ephesians 2.5 and 2.8 state it by saying, By grace you have been saved. You realize you didn't save yourself? Right? It was a gift. Right? God's salvation comes from His grace. Some describe grace as unmerited favor or unearned favor. It's His goodness. It outflows from His love. Right? If He didn't love us, there probably wouldn't be any grace. Both mercy and grace are found in Christ, and through His sacrifice on the cross, He's provided a way of escape. It's 
funny. Way of escape could also be synonymous with mercy, right? Okay. He's provided a mercy, a way of escape from the consequences of our sin. He did that when he went to the cross. That was an act of mercy, Jesus dying on the cross. He provided a way. God's also extended grace by providing salvation and proclaiming salvation to us through the Son. His teaching in Scripture and through the Spirit of God at work in us. And Hebrews 4.16 blends these two ideas in one powerful statement where he says, Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Shall I read that again? Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I don't know how many of you might be in a time of need, but hiding from God is probably the last thing you need to do. We need to have confidence that we can draw near to God. He will receive us. He will extend mercy and grace if we confess our sins, if we come humbly, right? He's paid for it all at the cross. This blind beggar just wanted to receive his sight. He just wanted to see. I don't know if he had seen at one time or if he was born blind, it doesn't really say. But he wanted his sight. So now I want to talk about the all-powerful Savior, God in Christ. Jesus asked him directly, what do you want me to do for you? Wouldn't that be nice if God would just come down and say, what do you want me to do for you? Do you know what you'd say? Do you have that thing ready to go? But he tells him, after he tells him uh, what he wants, Jesus responds by saying that his faith has made